This is a Commodore 1902 monitor, and it's in desperate need of some TLC. Hi, I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to Episode 5 of... In this retro restoration bit, we take a look at the Commodore 1902 CRT monitor and perform a full recap of the mainboard, neckboard, and power supply. While apart, we'll also modify it for analog RGB input, perform a quick retrobrite treatment, and take a look at some vertical stability issues. The 1902 was the earliest monitor produced for the Commodore 128 that supported the new 80-column digital RGBI mode for the NTSC market. The 1902 was made in Japan by Fujitsu Shinjo General beginning in 1985 using either a Hitachi or, as in this particular case, a Toshiba tube. The unit retailed for between 240 and 300 US dollars in January of 1986, which translates to 560 to 700 dollars in 2020 currency when adjusted for inflation. Over the years, Commodore sold many different monitor models, with several being based on the 1902 design, including the 1080 by Toshiba and the 2002 by Fujitsu, both for the just released Amiga. The 1084D came much later in 1988, but was essentially the same, but this time made by Daewoo. The 1902 features a 13-inch screen and has inputs for composite, separated Lumachroma, and digital RGB with intensity for use with the Commodore 128 and other CGA graphics machines. This particular 1902 came in a lot from an estate sale and was in pretty rough shape. In addition to several cracks and severe yellowing, the picture was unstable and would go out completely at random. So the very first thing was to replace all the original electrolytic capacitors. Right, so here is the obligatory warning. Do not attempt to work on CRTs without the proper knowledge and safety precautions. Enough said. The first step, of course, is disassembly. There are only six screws that need to be removed, then the back slides right off. Watch out for the two-pin connector for the speaker on the inside of the case. One thing I found with this particular model that differs from later monitors is that the boards are interconnected without the use of removable plugs. Because wires to the neck board and power supply are soldered on both ends, one has to be extremely careful when manipulating the boards and wires to access hard to reach spots. Further, RF shields are used on both the top and bottom of the main board and neck board that must be desoldered to gain access to some components. Later monitors didn't have such aggressive shielding, so I suspect the FCC rules may have been relaxed over time. The recap kit was purchased at console5.com and included everything required for this specific model. I did find that one cap was missing, but I had the correct spare already from a prior project. When it comes to small and inexpensive parts like caps, always order more than you need. The next thing to tackle was the UV damage. Since the monitor was already apart for recap, it was the perfect time. Unfortunately, it was also the middle of winter, so it would have to be done indoors. Initially, I tried the submersion method with both UV light and heating from a sous vide cooker. What I didn't count on was the heat and water pressure would cause the plastic tub to bow outward, making it just slightly too shallow to fully submerge the housing. I then switched to the peroxide cream and UV light method. It's already a lot better, but now that summer is here, I may try some direct sunlight to finish it up. As I mentioned earlier, the 1902 monitor was intended to be paired with the Commodore 128. As such, it supported digital but not analog RGB, as did the 2002 and 1084 models that were intended for the Amiga. 
Although the mode switch has a position for this input and the words are embossed in the plastic case, analog RGB was disabled in the 1902 at the time of manufacture. This was achieved by omission of several discrete components on the mainboard, despite all the required circuitry and logic chips being present. Because of this, it is just a matter of adding back the missing components to turn the 1902 into a fully functional 2002 that can work on an Amiga or any other device that supplies RGB with horizontal and vertical sync signals. While performing the recap, I added back the missing components, and now the monitor works great with an Amiga. I posted a link to the modification instructions in the description below. One of the remaining issues is the mode selection switch in the front panel. Even the slightest touch causes instability in the video signal. I hit it up with several applications of contact cleaner, but it hasn't really improved, and I may replace it outright in the future. For now it's functional, if not a little finicky. The big issue that remains is that in either of the RGB modes, the monitor still has vertical hold issues, a carryover from before the recap. When displaying an NTSC signal, the V-hold is rock solid across a large area of the adjustment range. However, when displaying an RGB signal, the V-hold is only stable in certain modes, such as text or low-resolution, low-color scenes, such as the workbench desktop. As soon as higher resolutions or colors are called for, it loses vertical stability and requires minute adjustments of the knob. In filming this, I noticed the image would become unstable after the monitor was powered on for 30 minutes or more, but I was unable to reproduce this a second time. Further, over the course of filming, the vertical stability issues gradually improved all on their own. Even when properly adjusted for a specific mode, you can see it struggle to sync when the image first appears. Because NTSC input wasn't affected, I examined the service manual and started replacing only components having to do with RGB input, and in particular, those related to the vertical sync signal. In the end, I replaced everything shown in this block diagram. Unfortunately, the issue still persists. I'm not sure where to look next, so if you have any ideas, please let me know in the comments. So that's where things stand. I'm pretty happy with the progress so far, and if I'm able to diagnose and fix the remaining issues, there may be a part two in the future, so stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on...